Good morning. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians in chapter number three. Philippians in chapter number three, as I mentioned, will take a little bit of time the next two weeks away from the book of Exodus, and then we'll be right back in the book of Exodus in chapter uh, number 25 on Sunday mornings. And But I uh, just want to take a little bit of time to give you kind of the, the, the thought and the heart of, of what the, um, of the theme will be through this next year. And... Um, in Philippians chapter number three. So when you found your place, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter number three, we're going to begin reading in verse number seven, and I'll read aloud as you follow along. Philippians chapter number three, the Bible says, but what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is, the law, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, and righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of scripture, that you might give us the illumination. Lord, we certainly need you this morning. Lord, we need to hear your word today. Lord, but... As importantly, we need to be doers of your word today. Lord, I pray that you'd help us on this, on this day as we come to the conclusion of this year, Lord, that there would be a time of reflection, Lord, but there would also be an anticipation for what is to come. Lord, and we think of all the things that are, will be planned for the following year and all the activities that will go on in, in home and, and job and church and life, and much will be done. Lord, but may our desire be that we may know Christ, that we might walk in fellowship with him, that we might know him. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today, Lord, as we begin to understand the groundwork of what it is to know the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us that understanding and help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. If you'll look with me, please, at verse number 10, the Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul is making this statement not in a sense of uh, looking back, but as a conclusion based upon looking back at what has taken place in his life. And this is this present tense uh, desire that he has. It's not that there was a time that I desired to know him and, and now knowing him and satis am satisfied. He says, no, listen, I have won Christ. I, I am found in Christ. And now that those things have taken place, I desire to know him. Well, we talk about knowing individuals and we talk about knowing people and there's all sorts of levels of knowing people. And I, I know many of you by name and I, I know many of you by sight. And, and, uh, but can we be honest? If we were to be real honest with each other, we don't really know each other. I know others by family. I know my children. I know my wife. And, and to be honest, they, they would know me better than, than you would know me. But can I be honest with you? They can only know me to a certain level. There are things that take place in my mind that they do not know. And we have different levels of knowing people. And similarly, there's going to be levels of knowing Christ, but this is not the cry of an unsaved man that he might receive Christ. This is a cry of a man that has already been forgiven of his sins and he knows Christ as his Savior. He's the apostle. He's the missionary. He has done the work of Christ. He has accomplished much for Christ. And as he reflects towards the end of his life, he said, man, that I may know him. And so we're going to take a little bit of time to understand how he got to this place and, and what it is, the desire. 
Uh, can I tell you, words are, are wonderful and words are a blessing. Uh, but it's more important to, to go beyond the words. Uh, we, we say things like, uh, I love Jesus. But you know what Jesus said? If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's more than just words that will be in place. And I'd like to give you a little illustration this morning that we'll kind of, we'll use as a backdrop for these passages. And, and it's, it's not mine. And, and you've probably heard of the preacher that, that first told it, uh, A preacher named Charles Spurgeon told this illustration. And and so I just want to give the illustration that he used in reference to some of these passages. There was a man that was uh, living during the Roman Empire and and, uh, he had been uprooted from his home and he was now a Roman slave. He was a slave and uh, over a period of time he finally has made his way uh, to the Colosseum. There you can picture the Colosseum as the hordes of people are there uh, shouting for the activities that will take place inside that Colosseum. And, and through a period of time, it becomes his, his point, and he is thrust out in the middle of that Colosseum. He is a slave. He is beyond the hope of escape for himself. And, and, but yet, just as to, to mock him in that process, uh, they give him means to fight. They give him some sort of dagger, so some, some sort of knife that he will hold up. And it's a useless means, no doubt, but it's going to be his ability to, to try to, to, to hold off the onslaught that is coming. And all of a sudden you see the the gates begin to rise around the circle of that Colosseum and uh, the king of beasts begin to come out and three and four of those great lions uh, begin to come out of those gates and and you can see him standing there with that knife and contemplating that this is the end. I've been a slave and I have no hope of escape and there's no ability and you can hear the roar of those lions and you can hear the shouting of the crowd as they desire for the blood to take place. And the man looks up into the Colosseum and he sees a a small remnant there in that Colosseum and uh, their cries are different than the cries of everybody else. As everybody else cries for blood, they cry, would you be saved? Would you be saved? And he looks around and there's a level of confusion on him as he sees all this uh, crowd around him. Certainly this is just a greater level of mockery that they would be giving him. But the cry still comes out. Even though there is such noise taking place of, of anger and hate and anticipation for his own death, he hears that cry of the remnant, would you be saved? He can deliver. He can deliver. And just almost out of this sheer desire that, uh, that surely is, is, is it possible as he looks at this dagger and he looks at those beasts knowing uh, there is going to be no ability that he would have to deliver himself from those, from those great beasts. And, and maybe he could get a couple of shots in before he goes down. He looks again to that remnant. He sees it in the corner of the stadium. He looks and he hears, would you be saved? He can deliver. And he cries out almost in in just hopelessness, I would be saved. If he can deliver me, let him deliver. Boy, and you see it all of a sudden out of the stadium, there comes one that comes down onto the floor of the arena and pushes him aside and he is removed and all of a sudden someone else stands in the gap and fights these beasts and and he is delivered, he is taken out of the stadium, he is taken to a place of resting, he is taken to a place of uh, of healing and his his wounds are, are, are mended and healed and he's put a coat on uh, around him and people begin to attend him and he begins to cry out who was he that saved me and they say he is the deliverer he is the one that has come in and delivered you oh what happened and all they say is there was victory that day there was victory that day and you know what his cry is I want to know him I want to know him. Oh man, he's done more than just deliver you. He's also provided for you all the means of healing that you need. He's provided this new robe that you're wearing. He's provided that new ring that you put on your finger. He's provided for you. Beyond that, you're no longer in slavery to the Roman Empire. You're free to serve him. And you cry out, who is he? I want to know him. 
Man, there is a desire to know the deliverer. There is a desire to know the one that has brought about our victory. And there is a desire to know him more than just the one that saved me. More than just the one that stepped in when I cried. I would be delivered. I would be saved. We want to know him more. But can I tell you, to be honest with you, there are many, many believers who are satisfied just knowing that they're not going to get eaten by the lion. There are many believers satisfied just knowing that somebody stepped in. Man, can you imagine that day at the Colosseum getting delivered, no longer be a Roman slave? You now have uh, uh, riches and you now have status and you now have freedom walking away from that stadium and saying, thank whoever it was, Thanks for the deliverer. Appreciate it. Now I'm off to live my life. Man, there's no, I, you, you couldn't imagine a person being that, that callous. You couldn't imagine a person being that brass that would say, hey, appreciate the deliverance. Now I'm off to live my life. I'm no longer a slave. I can do what I want to do. I have riches. I can live the way I want to live. Man, I can't imagine a person doing that. Any person in their right mind would be looking to know the one that delivered him more. Would be looking to, to, to meet him and to, to be with him and to fellowship him and to, to walk with him and to, and to spend time with him. Listen, the, 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 the solution to the apathy that exists in Christianity is not more activity, it's knowing him. The solution to the sin that is pervasive within the church that affects marriages and homes and families, it's not more religiosity, it's not more activity, it's not more programs, it's that families and husbands and wives and children might know Him. That is the desire that should be in place because I one, too was one day in that Colosseum. Hey, it wasn't, I wasn't enslaved to Rome, I was enslaved to sin. And it wasn't uh, the uh, king of beasts that was after me, but it was one who walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And my future was eternity in hell. And my future was to be apart from God and without him. But praise the Lord, there was a remnant. There was, there was some voices that were crying to me, hey, would you be delivered? Would you be delivered? And boy, for a while, for a long time, I thought I could handle the beast with that little knife that was given to me. I thought I could take the beast down. And what arrogance there was in that. Boy, I could take him down with that little uh, pocket knife that I had. And, and he just got getting closer and closer. And finally, there came a time and understanding that I was beyond hope. There, I had no ability to overcome uh, the, vic the, the, the slavery that was in my life. I had no ability to escape. But guess what? When I got to that place, I could still hear the cry of the remnant. Would you be delivered? Would you be delivered? And as I looked to him, I looked to them, they said, he would deliver you. Who would deliver me? Oh, the person of Jesus Christ would deliver. And that day I got on my knees and I said, Lord, deliver me. I would be delivered. And can I tell you what my Savior did? My Savior swooped in. He delivered me from sin. He took the payment and the penalty of sin for me. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. He overcame the devil. And he put on me a new garment. I now wear the king's garment. He's given me riches. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I'm a co-heir with Jesus Christ. He's given me a new name. He's given me a new song. He's given me a new life. He's given me everything that I have. And I turn from, the, turn from the stadium and say, thanks, that's all I want. Man, I can't imagine. But can I tell you, when you begin on this journey of knowing Christ more, you're going to pass a lot of people that that's enough. That's all they want to know. All they want to know is deliverance. All they want to know is that they're not going to spend eternity in hell. All they want to know is that he died for them. He rose for them. And that's enough. That's all I want to know. Oh, friend, I want to know him more. Amen. Can we see the sequence that takes place in the Apostle Paul's life? If you look at it with me, please. In Philippians chapter number three. Boy, if anybody had a dagger that they could hold in this life, it was the Apostle Paul. Boy, he had a dagger. He had a pretty good dagger, so to speak, of, of the accomplishments and deeds and activity and zeal religiously. But 
His dagger wasn't enough to overcome. Look what it says in beginning in verse uh, number four. It says, though um, I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he uh, hath there whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. He says, if anybody can trust in the deeds and the ability anybody's done, I can. I got a pretty good dagger to fight with. Here's what he says. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He says, I was born in the right, to the right family. I was born in the right place. I was taught the right things. I adhered to the right things. I became a person of religion and status. I did things out of zeal for God. I accomplished things. Man, I had a dagger to fight with. And look what he says in verse uh, number seven. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Well, why would he do that? Why would he count those accomplishments at loss for Christ? Verse number eight, yea, doubtless, I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, I counted them all loss. Here's why, he, here's, why, here's why he said that. He said, listen, there's really two options. You can fight with the dagger that you have. You've developed, you've developed skills and you've developed morals and you've developed activity and you've developed education and you've developed religion. You can fight with it. But ultimately, it will not produce righteousness that will satisfy God. That only comes through the righteousness of Christ. And Paul says in verse number eight, and being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but with that which is through faith of Christ. He said in order to be able to be in a position to know Christ more, there had to be a willingness to set aside my own righteousness and receive the righteousness of Christ. Now, can I give you some illustrations of what the righteousness of man is compared to the righteousness of God? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64, but our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Hey, in reference there, you can, you can imagine uh, that person with leprosy and the, and the, and the things, the pus that would ooze from his sores and, and just to try to give him just some momentary relief. He would take a rag that, that was his and he would begin to wipe away the pus and wipe away and, and bring that temporary soothing. You know what your mom used to say when you ever had a scratch or you had a cut? You know what you say? Don't scratch it. You know what we all did? We scratched it. You know why? It brought us temporary soothing. It would, it would take the pain away just for a minute. But you know what happened when you got done scratching? Not only would the pain be back, the pain would be worse. And so you know what you do? Scratch it some more. Scratch it some more. And when you get done scratching it, the pain would be back and the pain would be worse. And so you scratch it some more. Can I tell you that's the righteousness of men? It may bring you some temporary soothing. It may ease your conscience for just a little bit. Hey, look, I did this religious thing. Hey, look, I, I, I was nice. Hey, look, I didn't do that really bad thing. I, this is my righteousness, and I soothe myself momentarily. But guess what happens when you're done soothing yourself? The pain comes back, and it worse, it's worse than it was before. Because you can soothe yourself, but you cannot cleanse leprosy with a rag. It's impossible. You cannot cleanse leprosy with a rag. And here's the Apostle Paul saying, if anybody had a nice rag, I mean a fancy rag, one of those things, a doily rag. Those are pretty impressive rags. A doily, you know, and it, it was silk made and it was nice. It was beautiful. If anybody had a rag, I had a rag. It was an impressive rag. It was, a, it was, it was beautiful. But guess what happened when he would begin to wipe it upon the sin of his life? It might bring him some temporary soothing but it wouldn't solve the problem. Not the righteousness, his own righteousness. He needed the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Can I tell you the sadness that it brings me to think about 
the number of people in our world, the number of people in our community, the number of people right here in Spring Hill that are religious, that are just trying to soothe the problem of their sin and the slavery of their sin, just trying to have a break from it for just a little bit. Because even though nobody else may not know what exists inside their mind and their heart, God knows and he's convicted them and he's reminded them and they just want some soothing. So they take their own righteousness and they soothe themselves just for a minute. And it works. But when they're done, it comes back. Because you can't heal leprosy with a rag. Here's the Apostle Paul saying, I had everything anybody could want religiously. I had everything anybody could want educationally. I had everything anybody could want as far as morality and even zeal for God. But all it was, was a dirty rag and a pocket knife. It would bring me no salvation. It would bring me no hope. Can you imagine, you remember the day when the Apostle Paul met Jesus? On the road to Damascus. He was on his way to perform this religious activity, this activity of such zeal to persecute those that would be contrary to his religion. Such zeal that he would express. He is on his way. He had purpose and he had planning and he had, he had religion and education and morals. He had everything. He was on his way. And this great light shone, blinded him. Who art thou? Jesus said, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Why do you continue to kick against the pricks? Who art thou? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. In that day, Paul recognized his righteousness, his rag would never cleanse his leprosy. And his pocket knife could never defeat the lions. You know what he said? What wilt thou have me to do? And on that day, he met Jesus. You know what he says about his rag of righteousness? I count it as nothing. Nothing. You know what he said about his pocket knife of morality, uh, his weapons of strength? I count it but nothing. I just want him. I just want to win Jesus Christ. I just want to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And on that day, when Jesus called out to him and drew him, Paul called out just like the man in the Colosseum, I would be delivered. I would be delivered. And Jesus Christ delivered him. Now look what it says in verse number nine. It says, and being found in him. Boy, there's a transition that takes place. To be accepted in the beloved. Paul had all his religious activity, all his morality, all, all, all the, the zeal that he wanted, but he was outside of a relationship with Christ. He was yet in slavery to sin. But on that day, when he put his faith and trust in Christ, cried out for deliverance as a broken man, and Jesus Christ delivered him and healed him, he was no longer Paul. He was no longer Saul, the, the persecutor, and he's going to become Paul, the apostle, but it's because he's found in the person of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ delivered him. He saved him. He took him from a life of slavery to a life of service. He took him to a destination of hell to a destination of heaven. That took place on that day when he met Jesus. Now, can I help you, friend? You can never know him until you meet him. You can never know him. You say, preacher, you're, you're preaching to the church this morning. You're preaching to the people that are here. Yeah, I know. I know. And it may be possible that you got a really fancy rag. But you can't know him until you've met him. I know. You, you, it may be possible that you got a really fancy knife. In our, in our house, we love knives. For Christmas, it's who got the best pocket knife. And one had a knife, had a saw on it. The other one had a spoon and a fork on it, man. I mean, they were fancy knives. They are awesome. We love knives, but can I tell you? Whew, a knife is not going to defeat a lion. You can take out the fork, the knife, even the little scissors that are on there. Not going <laughs> to defeat the lion. You may have a fancy knife. You may be religious. You may have zeal. 
You may have morality. You may have activity. You may have upbringing. You may have pedigree and heredity. You may have all those things. But if you have not met Jesus Christ, then you're not found in him. And can I tell you, friend, you can't know him until you've met him. The Apostle Paul says, first thing that I recognize is what I had was not worth anything. And I willingly threw it aside for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Hey, friend, what are you holding on to? What do you have your hope in? You know, if you were to talk to the Apostle Paul, he could tell you about the day he met Jesus. He could tell you. In fact, several times he just gives his testimony as his method of preaching. He could tell you about the day that he met Jesus. And it's only people that have met Jesus that can have a desire to know Jesus. Can you tell me about the day you met Jesus? Can you tell me about the day that you realized your rag of righteousness was nothing compared to his? Can you tell me about the day that your knife of morality and, and zeal was nothing compared to the forgiveness that comes to the person of Jesus Christ? Can you tell me about the day that you met Jesus? Oh, preacher, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You've been walking around with a rag of righteousness. And it's only as good as the sin you try to wipe off. And all you can do is wipe off the surface, the pus that oozes from the sin. You can't take away the sin. You need to meet Jesus. Oh, listen, preacher, my, my uncle was a Baptist preacher. I, everybody's uncle was a Baptist preacher. I'm telling you. Everybody I meet, well, my uncle was a Baptist preacher. God bless your uncle. Listen, your uncle cannot take away your sin. The fact that you're born in a religious family or a family of believers doesn't take away your sin. Your striving and your deeds and your morality cannot take away your sin. You must have met Jesus. Oh, preacher, I'm just a young person. Surely I don't have enough sin. You know how many times you have to sin to be a sinner? Just once. Can I tell you the blessing of knowing Christ? Listen, the ground is level at the cross. There's no superiority. I was more worthy of Jesus than you were. No, friend. None of us was worthy. None of us was worthy. Hey, some may have a better rag. All it means is it can soak up more pus, but it doesn't take away sin. Nobody was worthy of receiving Jesus Christ. But I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot know him until you've met him. Do not believe, do not think that the desire to know him or your ability to be religious is the fact that you've met Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'd throw everything aside to meet Jesus Christ. I'd throw it all aside. And to be found in him. Verse number nine, it says this, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You say, preacher, okay. I want to meet him. How do I meet him? Can you introduce me to Christ this morning? I can introduce you to him through the word of God. Amen. Yeah, but what do I do then? You must believe. You have to put your faith in him. Where am I going to get that kind of faith from? He is the author and finisher of my faith. That man that day in that Colosseum, all he heard was the cry. Would you be delivered? Would you be delivered? He can deliver you. Seeing all the crowd, he looked at that small remnant and said, I would be delivered. I would. There was no deed that he did. All he did was cry out and say, I would. And the deliverer will come and deliver you from your sins and give you a home in heaven and tra transform your life and change your life, not based upon your deeds, but simply based upon your cry of faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, no person is going to be able to stand at the gates of heaven and say, I deserve to get in. Not a single person. But there will be many who will say, I heard the cry of the deliverer. And I simply responded, Lord, I'm helpless and I'm hopeless. Will you deliver me? Will you deliver me? Preacher, I, how dare you call me helpless and hopeless? Well, friend, you're not ready to be delivered. Yes, but I've done a lot of good things. You're not ready to be delivered. But I'm a good person. You're not ready to be delivered. You know what Paul said? I count it all but dung, but waste, just so I could know Christ. Until you recognize the hopelessness of your life without Christ, you will not hear the cry. Until you recognize your situation in slavery to your sin, you will not hear the cry. And the cry is, would you be delivered? But I still got a knife. Go ahead and fight on. Would you be delivered? But I got a rag. Would you be delivered? Until you set the knife down and set the rag down and say, I am hopeless. Without Christ, there is no hope for me. And hear the cry. You would be delivered. Verse number 10 says this, and we'll be done. Look what it says. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable unto his death. Can I tell you something amazing when you meet Christ? When you meet Jesus Christ, He changes your life. He changes your appetites. He changes your hopes. He changes your dreams. He changes your goals. <coughs> Paul goes from one that says, I count everything as nothing just so that I can meet Him, so I can win Him, so I can be found in Him. And as soon as he gets a taste of Jesus Christ in salvation, you know what he says? I want more. I want more. Friend, if you've never met Jesus Christ, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today. Oh, preacher, but everybody thinks I'm saved. I don't care. I don't care. You can't know him unless you met him. Oh, preacher, but what about all my religious activity? Don't care. You can't know him unless you've met him. But what about my family? What are they going to think? Well, if they know Christ, they'll celebrate with you. You can't know him unless you've met him. Our theme this year is that I may know Christ. I'm going to be honest with you. The theme is for believers. For believers to know Christ more. But we cannot go forward unless we first make sure of our salvation. Make sure of our salvation. As a young person, I cried out to God. Really had no knowledge of... I just was performing a religious activity. And in my 20s, God began convicting me. And to be honest with you, conviction existed before that. But I was listening. Before that, my rag was too nice and my pocket knife was too shiny. Got to a place where I realized it's just a rag. It's just a knife. And in my 20s, I started hearing the cry. Would you be delivered? Would you be delivered? I was already married. Had a couple kids. I was working at a church. And I heard the cry. Would you be delivered? My first response is, what? Look at this rag. Look at this knife. It's pretty impressive stuff. And all I could hear was, would you be delivered? And eventually I got to the place where the rag meant nothing. And the knife meant nothing. And all I wanted to do was win Jesus Christ. And I cried out to God, I would be delivered. I would be delivered. 
And I bowed my head and called upon Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And you know what my desire has been since then? That I may know Him. You say, so you've come, you've come a long way now. Do you, do you know him? Oh, I know him. But you know what my desire is? That I may know him. Oh, that we would desire to know Jesus Christ. If you've never met Jesus Christ, and your heart of hearts right now, God is speaking to you saying, would you be delivered? Today is the day of salvation. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, do you desire to know Jesus Christ? Let's pray, Lord. I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we would respond in obedience to you. Lord, maybe there would be some today, Lord, that if they were honest, they hear the cry. Lord, even as Brother Adam a couple weeks ago heard the cry and responded, I would be delivered. And others have heard the cry and said, I would be delivered. Lord, maybe there are some here today. Maybe they're visiting. Maybe they're regular. I have no idea. But I would ask this question, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts right now. And your spirit would bear witness with their spirit. That your spirit would do the job of convicting them of what is needed in their life. And might they be willing to ask the question, do I know him? Am I found in him? Am I a child of God? Have I been delivered from the slavery of sin? Is Jesus Christ my personal Savior? Not am I religious, not am I desire to do good, none of those things, but do I personally know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Lord, I pray that you do a work in our hearts this morning. That we would acknowledge our meaning of you before we can acknowledge our desiring to get to know you. Lord, maybe there would be some here today that would say, I need to meet Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Or maybe there would be Christians and their prayer would just simply be, Lord, I, I, I've won you. I'm found in you. Now I have a prayer and a desire that I may know you. Lord, how transforming. Not a life of religiosity, but a relationship with Jesus Christ, a pursuit, a hunger, a thirst for righteousness, that I may know him. But I pray that you'd help us to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.